Good evening, everyone. Thank you for making. Thank you. Thank you for making it through the uh, the rain, through the wet streets. We appreciate it. It's wonderful to see such a, a tremendous crowd. My name is Ben Dworkin. I am the director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics. Welcome. On behalf of Ryder University and the Rebovich Institute, I want to thank all of you for taking time out to join us for an evening with the Honorable Cory Booker. Tonight's event is also being supported by our good friends at the law firm of Genova, Burns, Giantomasi, and Webster. We thank them for their support of the Rebovich Institute, and we encourage all of you, please, help us help our students with intern scholarships, help us provide more civic programming like tonight's. After my brief remarks and introduction, Mayor Booker will come out and he'll speak for a while. He will then take some questions from the audience. You will see, you might have seen, we have uh, microphones that will be set up at the front of each aisle. Two standing mics. At the appropriate time when Mayor Booker says he's ready for a Q&A, anyone who would like to ask a question, please come down. Don't rush safely. Come on down uh, and line up, and he'll take as many questions as uh, he can. Tonight's program is part of our ongoing Governing New Jersey series. It is a continuing parade of speakers who are leaders in Garden State politics coming to Ryder University. Now, one part of the mission of the Rebovich Institute is to raise the level of political discourse in our state. In part, we do this through our Governing New Jersey series. A second part of our mission is to train the next generation of political leadership. Let me say that I am thrilled to see so many students here tonight, even those that I didn't assign to come here. It is wonderful to see you, though. And as is our custom, when we get to the Q&A period, the first two questions need to come from Ryder students. Through this entire event, though this, excuse me, though this entire event is on the record, we also ask that members of the press not ask questions during the Q&A. Please leave those opportunities for the students and the general public. And finally, we ask that you limit flash photography to when everybody's applauding, at the beginning and at the end, so we don't blind the poor man in the middle of it. There's an old story about the French revolutionary sitting in a cafe with a large crowd of Parisians suddenly storms by, marching, chanting pitchforks, torches towards the Bastille, that infamous French prison. The French revolutionary sitting on the sidewalk, sipping his cafe, Sips, puts it down, and says to his friend, there go my people. I'm their leader. There are people, there are leaders who call themselves leaders, but they just follow the crowd. And then there are people who actually lead, the people who say, follow me. Our guest tonight is decidedly in that category. He is a man who is out front of the people. He is out front of his own party on any number of issues. People have chosen to follow him because he is leading. We are honored to have such a leader with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the mayor of Brick City, Newark, New Jersey, the Honorable Cory Booker. How's everybody doing? Hello, hello. So thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know if they could turn up the house lights a little bit, because I would really love to see who I'm talking to. And right now, it's just obscure faces. And I want to see if there's like an ex-girlfriend here, and I need to run. <laughs> um, so if they could turn up the house lights a little bit, I'd really appreciate it. Um, and I'll wait. I won't wait for that, but hopefully at some point we can do it. I am so excited to be here. I, I, there's something about speaking to a Jersey college that makes me feel so good. And I don't want to take away from other colleges I've often been invited to speak to, but there's something about coming home uh, to my, in my own community, in my own state, and, and, and talking. And I don't have to deal with questions about Snooky when I travel. You know, it's just terrible, you know. I get into arguments with people when I try to assert that I was the first New Jersey situation before <laughs> that Long Islander to come down. So 
Uh, so it's really good to be in the community. I'm, and I'm most looking forward to uh, getting into an exchange with you guys and hearing from students especially about things that are on your mind. And really, I want to, when we open it up for Q&A, I want to talk about uh, anything and everything that you guys have on your mind, whether it's uh, politics or the challenges uh, that we hear more and more about balancing work and life, uh, whether it's um, issues uh, of uh, social concern, whatever you want to talk about, I'm really looking forward to doing it. But since I'm with students, I really would love to just maybe talk about why I'm doing what I'm doing and what drives me uh, every single day uh, and, and, and sort of frame that for you so at least you know what motivates me on a personal basis. And I, you have to understand, I, I feel this sense of, uh, of fortune. I like thank Providence for being who I am, being where I am. Uh, I feel like I'm in the luckiest, uh, sort of the luckiest guy in the world to have the job of my dreams uh, right now to do every day and to work with other, uh, other Newarkers, other New Jerseyans, other Americans in what I think is some of the most important battles in our country, to make the ideals of this country real for every single person. And, and, and that's the story of our democracy that excites me. And this excitement really comes, uh, most importantly, from my parents. You know, I have this, uh, these two parents who are really incredible human beings to me. Uh, and, and once you sort of hit that age of 40, you start to get perspectives on your parents that you didn't really have when you were a teenager. And the perspective that I have, <laughs> this is better, because now we're all in the dark. And I actually can see folks better. The, the light is out of my eyes. Um, but, uh, but can you guys see? You can see the dim. I actually look better when the light is down. Um, now it's back blinding me again. Just turn up the house lights, whoever's in charge. Turn up the house lights. OK, we're working on it. I'm going to keep going. So the pers ah, so exciting. Now you guys have light, and I don't. I feel like I am Little Red Riding Hood. The first one's too bright, the second one's too dark. We're going to get to just right. But, right. but I could come out there for now. <laughs> Can you guys see me? <laughs> yes. All right. This is improvisation. So look, for those of you who are my age, as a teenager, you will not see this as clearly at, thank you very much, somebody, <laughs> class of 69. <laughs> Somebody, uh, the, 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 you don't see it as much when you're younger because you, don't, you haven't really got that perspective on your parents. I, I'm now at the age where my parents had already, my brother and I, when my parents were my age, were already like three and four and five years old. And so it's this weird thing, like I know nothing about kids and my parents were raising me when they were my age. And the thing I've learned about my parents, which is really awesome, is that I now realize that they only have about 60 stories that they tell me over and over and over again, the same stories. And what's wonderful about these stories is that when my mom tells them, she has this penchant for accuracy and detail. And when my, when my dad tells them, that makes them really great because I learn something new every time my mom talks. I learn a new fact, a new detail about my history that's so important. And then when my dad talks, it's really exciting to me because he has a penchant for hyperbole and exaggeration. And, and every time he tells a story, it gets more dramatic and more interesting. It's worse than like a, like a Latino soap opera. I mean, it's like a novella. It's like, Dad, what is happening this time? And so, but the great thing about that and my parents and their stories is this theme of our democracy is what really drives so many of them. And they too feel at this point in their lives, a sense of blessing to be a part of this nation. Now, that might seem kind of odd because their stories are actually of difficulties and challenges, but a lot of them actually have to do with the story, the idea that this nation, every generation has made more real on the promise of this democracy. And this is what I grew up hearing. Look, my dad was born poor, and he now refuses to listen to his son say this. My father now will heckle me. This literally happened. He will heckle me for saying that he was poor. He'll be like, don't tell those people I was poor. Because I was just po, P-O. I couldn't afford the other two letters. I was a po' boy from North Carolina. 
and he will exaggerate his childhood. The weather patterns have changed dramatically over the time. You know, it's crazy. I mean, there's like storms every time. It's like, it, it was like Seattle. It never stopped raining in the mountains of North Carolina. And the hail period went from hail the size of golf balls to literally every sports ball made an appearance in his stories and to the point now that we're beach balls. And look, I, I believe in, in like these 10 commandments, thou shalt honor thy mother and father. That's a difficult one when it comes to my dad because I had to get in an argument with him a couple years ago when I said, Dad, there's no way. You lived in the mountains of North Carolina. There's no way you could have had a tsunami hit that town. <laughs> and my father gets indignant with me. There was a tsunami boy. It was before the internet. You can't look it up, but it happened. <laughs> and, and so, and so this, is, this is like the, 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 the way I grew up. These stories, this oral tradition in my family. And I'll tell you, Amazingly, there's a beauty in it. You see, the beauty is that my father was born to a single mother. 70% of the kids in my city, I think it's exactly 71% of my kids in Newark, this is not just a Newark thing, it's a national trend, 71% of my kids are born to single moms. And interestingly, my dad's mom couldn't take care of him, and so he was raised for a while by his grandmother, and roughly, the last data I looked at, about 10% of my kids in Newark are, are being raised by their grandparents. And then my father's grandmother couldn't take care of him anymore. And folks in this community, communities like ours, would not let my dad fail. And they made sure he had food on the table and a roof over his head. I mean, this amazes me. My father was put on the right track Everybody in that community saw him as their child. And then my father had no history of college education. And so what happened was that when it was time to go to college, my dad was just going to graduate from high school and work. But people in that town said no. Two Thanksgiving ago, my normal joking father started crying when people said, to, when, he, when we were going around the table, some of you guys probably do this in your families, what are you thankful for? Well, my dad started crying because he said, he was talking about the people that put dollar bills in envelopes so that he could afford his first semester's tuition at a, a college called North Carolina Central University. And he was crying because he said, I can't remember all of their names. And so this is sort of the story, and it goes on. Every chapter of, my, of the oral tradition, the book of my existence, my pre-existence, is these stories. It, I, I had this privilege, I hope some of you get one day, I got to be the commencement speaker at my mom's university on the 50th reunion, her 50th reunion from graduating from that university. And this is the difficult thing about my mom. And I suspect it's a power that many women have. And this is the power to take your child, even when they are an adult, and still make them feel like they're 12. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I mean, I have these arguments with my mom now. I'm leaving, and she'll say, she'll call out to me before I leave, did you comb your hair? I'm like, Mom, I don't have hair anymore. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm at this commencement, and the, 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 the night before they had this fancy dinner, I was the commencement speaker. Uh, people were coming over, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Commencement Speaker, please sit here, please do it. And I felt important. And my mom comes over to me at, during the dinner, and she's like, come here, boy, come here. I look up at her, and she says, come here. And she starts pulling me out of my chair, pulling me along. And I'm pulling back, and I said, let me go. I'm the mayor, Mom. Come on. I need to be mayoral. And, and she's bringing me to these tables of these other Americans. And she's introducing me to them and saying, look, this is the woman that led our student boycotts, that was threatened to be expelled for her ac activism. And then she takes me to another person. This is the person that led our voter registration drives. And it's not like today. This is when people were getting killed for, for registering people to vote. Goodwin, Cheney, Schwarner, you all know this history. It was almost like she was walking me around saying, pay attention, Corey. This person died, struggled for you. This person fought for you. When, when my parents both graduated, one from North Carolina Central in North Carolina, one from uh, Fisk University in Tennessee, they both came north for opportunity and landed in Washington, D.C. And they found out that even though they were college-educated prepared, there were many companies that wouldn't hire them because of the color of their skin. 
But yet there were incredible white folks and black folks, activists, who believed in the ideals of this country, who on their own free time, they weren't expected to do this, required to do this, it wasn't their job. They said they're going to fight to change this. And it was because of their activism, my parents got jobs where they were some of the first black people hired in them. Eventually, they went to work for IBM, two of the first African Americans hired. And that opportunity, people leveraging open that door, suddenly gave my chance, parents a chance to flourish. And they did. They got jobs up here in Franklin Lakes. IBM had a facility there in Manhattan. IBM had a facility. They were looking for houses to buy. And in this great state of New Jersey, there were towns around my birth, 1969, 70, that wouldn't let black families move in. And so my parents would go to great towns and they would be told that the house they were looking at was taken off the market or it had already been sold. But yet it was these New Jerseyans, black and white, who came together in a storefront in this neighborhood, in, this, in Bergen County, to form something called the Fair Housing Council. And they would send couples out after my parents, a white couple out after my parents. And the day that they found the house that I grew up in, they were told it was sold. The other couple came behind them, found out it was still for sale, put a bid on the house. The bid was accepted. On the day of the closing, my father shows up with a, with a lawyer whose name I don't know. It's almost embarrassing to me. And they walked up to the real estate agent, and, they, and the real estate agent stood there and looked at the, my father, confused, and the, and the lawyer said proudly, he said, you are in violation of New Jersey fair housing law, and went through this rehearsed speech, but he didn't get to finish his speech, because the real estate agent jumps up and punches my dad's lawyer in the nose. And then he sigs a dog on my dad. Now the size of the dog has changed over the years. <laughs> My father insists now it was Stephen King's Cujo. My mom will look down and say it was just Dorothy's Toto, a little, little thing. But this is me now. That's now the story of me begins. One generation, poverty. One generation, segregation. One generation ago, I took an entire town's intervention in the lives of my father, and one generation later, I'm growing up in Harrington Park, New Jersey. This incredible community of good people who watched out over me as I walked to elementary school, who would knock on my parents' door when they first moved there and welcome them to the neighborhood. My father watched my brother and I get older, and he would always be amazed, and he would interrupt us sometimes, especially if he saw me walking around proud. By the time I was a high school senior, I was a high school senior. I was a high school football All-American. I was president of my, my senior class in high school. I was honor roll, honor society. And my father would look at me going into the refrigerator and said, boy, don't you dare walk around here like you hit a triple. Because you were born on third base. And he'd come up to me and he'd say profound things. Like, you are a physical manifestation of a conspiracy of love conspiracy of love. And you need to understand that you drink deeply from wells of freedom and liberty and opportunity that you did not dig. You eat lavishly from banquet tables that were prepared for you by your ancestors. And so don't dare sit back just consuming, getting dumb, fat, and happy. There's work to do. You've got to use these blessings, metabolize them in your body, this privilege that you have and use it to fuel yourself to be a part of the story of America. Because as King said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. America's not gonna get better because that's the momentum we've created. This country necessitates activism, engagement, involvement. And what frustrated my parents is, I have to say sometimes what frustrates me, is that so many of us I uh, think that democracy is a spectator sport, that we can just sit on the sidelines giving color commentary about what's going on. Or we can get caught up in a toxic state of being. I call it sedentary agitation. When we're so upset about what's going on in the world, but we don't get up and do anything about it. We think these problems are so big that we allow our inability to do everything to undermine our determination to do something. And so my parents, with my brother and I, they didn't say go out and change the world. They said go out and get involved and do something. Be a part of that conspiracy. 
Tell your truth every single day because God created you unique. Your authenticity, this world is starved for it. Lincoln used to say this. He said, everyone is born and original, but sadly, most die copies. Don't die a copy, I would be told. You've got to courageously pursue your greatest dreams for yourself, whatever they may be, to be a teacher, to be a business person, whatever it is, what your calling is, what your unique avocation is, pursue it with courage and alacrity, enthusiasm. And so that's what my brother and I did. That we were called to show up, all of us, to show up in this world, not to shrink from who we truly are. Look, I love faith traditions. I love them. Walk into the mayor's office right now, you will see a stack of books, the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Torah. It's almost like I just want to be sure, just in case the end of days come and one of them doesn't work, I got another one to try. And there's this wonderful story, this wonderful moment where God walks in in the three Abrahamic faiths that God walks into the Garden of Eden and he asks, Adam, where are you? Because you all know the story, Adam's butt naked, hiding behind some bushes, right? Somebody, this, listen, Rick Santorum said that colleges and universities were godless places. Don't let me down here. <laughs> Don't let me down. And, and I, I've asked people, ministers and rabbis and imams about this story and everybody says the same thing. God wasn't looking for the physical Adam. He was wondering, where is this person that I created in my image? Where is this person I imbued with, with my genius, with my spirit? Why are they playing small and shrinking from who they truly are? What I've come to realize, and I've had to learn this lesson over and over again, is that we just got to show up. And most of us don't. We don't show up. I'll give you a painful thing, a story about this, painful to me. I, 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 was, I was elected mayor. And before that, though, I'd lived for, gosh, I lived in eight years in a, in a place called Brick Towers. Eventually, these public housing projects. Somebody give me a hoot, Brick, Brick, Brick Towers? <laughs> All right. Did you live in Brick Towers? I love you. <laughs> What years did you live there, if you don't mind telling me? When they opened up, they opened at 69. Oh my gosh, so 69 to when? So the mid-80s, in, in, in mid, early 80s. So you started getting out before things got too off the hook. Okay. So Brick Towers was this great building when you moved in, great building. Did you have a look at Manhattan? Did you see, look over the hill? You were on the fifth floor. Okay, I was on the six, 16th floor. But the problem is when I moved in there, things were off the hook. And, but the same tenant president you and I both had, you know who that is? Miss Virginia Jones. I talk about Miss Virginia Jones in about half of all my speeches because she was a she took care of everybody. She took care of everybody. And so this is my point. I want to get back to Miss Jones. God, what's your name? Uh, Ida Tyson. That's a good name. <laughs> Ida Tyson from Brick Towers. OK, so by the time I moved into Brick Towers, I'm going to get to this. We're going to end with a Miss Jones story in honor of Ida. <laughs> Because this, no, you don't, they don't make Miss Joneses that much anymore in this world, but it's true, it's true. And so now we fast forward to 2005, and I had seen now kids grow up in brick towers. And the problem was, is it was a tough place. And I watched some of these kids, good kids, sitting in the lobby, hanging out in, in, in brick towers. And by this time, the buildings had been taken over by the housing authority. It used to be, you used to have to get a home inspection before you moved in there. Then a slumlord took over. We, I came around that time, we, the slumlord got convicted in federal court. We started investigating. Miss Jones punched him. Did you know the story? 
punched that, this elderly octogenarian straight up punched this guy. The guy takes her to court. The judge looks at grown man my age, looks at little old woman, dismisses the case. <laughs> Miss Jones is 1-0 and in her legal battles. And so I'm coming home every day, and these kids are hanging out in the lobby, and I'm watching them get older. Now they're in high school, Central High, Blue Devils. Now I come home, and occasionally there's a smell in the lobby that I had not smelled since fraternities at Stanford. <laughs> some wacky tobacco and and I'm in favor of medical marijuana for the for the record <laughs> um, <laughs> and and we'll get the policy in a minute and 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 so now I start worrying the guy starts showing some colors and I start worrying so I'm worried so I start taking the guys out to dinner to movies I started bringing friends of my I, I had suspicion that they were selling marijuana uh, again like guys I knew at Stanford um, but not unlike Stanford, uh, where fraternities didn't get raided by police, uh, you're, you're a poor minority inner city and you're selling drugs, it's a lot more dangerous endeavor. So I, I, I brought them together with me and brought them with other friends of mine that had sold uh, narcotics and had gotten out and was, things were going well, but then I was running for mayor. And I was suddenly, as my father would say, impotent again. And, and I, I, I got busy. I sort of let it go, but the kids stayed in that lobby. I would walk through the lobby all the time, and they would cheer. One of them, who's hilarious, he would play with some kind of funny prank on me every time. You know, I would be bringing them home from whatever restaurant or food I went to, and, and they would have like you know my lawn signs that they picked up and say Cory Booker for mayor. As I went into the, into the elevator, I'm like, that lawn sign cost me a buck fifty. Put it back where you found it. <laughs> and so then I get elected, and I had death threats against me because we were coming down hard. We said we were gonna go after the gang violence in the city. FBI told us we had credible death threats. And so the mayor at the time was not providing security for me. I was a mayor elect. And so thankfully the state police and the county police said, well, until you are the mayor and actually run the police department, we'll give you security. So I would come home at night to brick towers with a phalanx of guys with automatic weapons. And I don't know about you guys in high school. We used to hang out by the friendlies in Norwood. But if cops were showing up to that area, we didn't want to hang out there. And so when M16s showed up in the lobby of Brick Towers, the fellas weren't there anymore. And so now I'm mayor. I get elected. And my first month, it was crime. That was the obsession, the focus. We were going to drive it down. And violent crime was spiking in 2005 and 2006. So I would go work my day as mayor, jump in the police car at night, volunteer cops, some of them that are here tonight, volunteered hours. We would drive around at 4 o'clock in the morning. I would show up at every shooting scene, show up at every murder, and I would get out of the car and I would talk to people. This is not who we are. This is not America. We are Newark. We can do better. It was almost like I was sort of a clergy member attending to the spirit of the city. One day I get called a month into my term and I see two men lying on the pavement bleeding it red and I ignore them because I'm talking to the people. And that night I go to bed and I wake up the next morning and I see the name Hassan Washington. The kid in the lobby that reminded me of my dad. His funeral, I will never forget. I'm a, I'm, I'm a newly minted mayor. I, I still have that new mayor smell. And I'm standing in that funeral and I just get overcome. I can't, I can't engage. I, I don't have it in me to tell people we're going to get through this. I don't have it in me. You see, I was dealing with this problem I had that God had put this kid right in front of me on my doorstep. I walked past him every day. What if people did that to my dad? I wouldn't be here. And I just stood in that funeral. I couldn't be mayor. I couldn't tend to other people's feelings. I was fighting the demons inside me. And I get to, uh, I get to a point where I can't take it anymore. And I leave. I jump in the car that the city had assigned me. I tell them to take me to my office. And I walk into Newark City Hall this historic building, I go into the Newark mayor's office where legendary names, Ken Gibson, Hugh Adnizio, all these legendary names sat. I closed and locked the door. I sat on that couch and I weeped like a seven-year-old boy 
because I could not accept the fact that everybody showed up at this kid's funeral. There were teachers, principal, community leaders, activists, neighbors from Brick Towers. Every one of us showed up for his death, but where were we for his life? Where were we? When he started showing colors and joining a gang, where were we? When he started smoking pot, where were we? When he started dealing, this kid was a genius. He was a born leader. We need him. His, his entrepreneurialism, he could have been a teacher, he could have been a scientist, he could have been mayor of Newark. But we didn't show up. We've gotten so disconnected from each other that we don't even feel invested in that kid. Nobody even knows that kid's name. He, he, I could name lots of people, Jean Benet Ramsey and Natalie. I could name lots of people murdered, but nobody knows Hassan. And so, this is to me the message of the beginning of our morality. Are we going to show up? And it's not just the mayor that has to show up. It's us as citizens of this country. We will not be called. We will not be called to get on buses as people did in New Jersey, white and black, to drive into the South, knowing that bus will be stopped, knowing that state troopers and, and people filled with hate will drag us off that bus, beat us, will literally bomb the bus. We won't be called to do that. We're not going to be called. When totalitarianism and evil is sweeping across Europe, we're not going to be called to storm beaches in Normandy knowing that when we land there, the most of us are going to get shot. We're not going to be called to be a Quaker in a farmhouse giving shelter in the barn to a runaway slave knowing that if we get caught, we will be tried. We will lose our freedom. We're not going to be called to stand up and protest sweatshops in New Jersey, to stand up against union busters who, with wielding billy clubs, will crack the skulls of our ancestors who dared to say there should be a five-day work week, that there should be no child labor. We're not going to be called to do those things. But yet, when it comes to the small acts of decency and kindness and love and compassion and understanding the truth of America is that we are not we are not simply a nation with a declaration of independence. We're far more elegant and intricate and beautiful than that. The truth of our nation is a declaration of interdependence, that we need each other. And so for me, what motivates me every day is I just want to live up to the goodness and the kindness and the mercy that got me here before you today. We tend to applaud like individual acts of courage. I can tell you courage is not running into a burning building. No. Courage is every day, and I see it in my city, every day, knowing how precious every moment is, that the great power you have is to either accept conditions as they are or take responsibility for changing them. And the great agents of our democracy are those people that, that use every day to accept responsibility and make a change. Let me show you courage. Courage is a guy on Elizabeth Avenue in Newark, a retired state worker who sees a drug lot across the street in the Center for Violence and, and Crime, overthrown with weeds and debris, who gets a check in the mail and doesn't say, Yahoo, I got some money. Instead, with his stimulus check, he says, I'm going to be a philanthropist and an activist and takes his money and goes to Home Depot in Newark on Springfield Avenue and buys a plastic bags, buys a rake, buys a lawnmower, goes and gets some gas, and then an old man, putting us young men to shame, goes into a drug lot, not to fight the drug dealers, just to clean, picks up some trash, stops, goes back home a day later, does the same thing, a few days later, does the same thing, Two, three months pass, and that lot for crime and debris looks better than the White House lawn. And what happens? The drug dealers leave, and he becomes a hero in the building. Courage. 
Uriel Ocasio comes out from a diner and a gunman's there, shoots and murders his friend, begins to shoot at him. He catches a bullet in the side of his head, catches one in his shoulder, catches one in the side of his, of his, of his gut, but charges a man, tackles him, says to me that all he knew is he was not going to let go. Here he is, bleeding profusely, just holding that man until the police come. Now, you may think that's courage, but that's a moment. We all have the same instinct. One of the three Fs is going to happen to us. We're going to flee, freeze, or fight. His instincts had him fight. That may be courage to you, but this is courage to me. At his bedside, I come. This happens to me half the times I do hospital visits, mayor, firefighters, police officers. Half the time, they get up and say, mayor, everything's going to be OK. And I'm like, that's my line, man. I'm supposed to tell you that. And, and, and Uriel Acasso says the same thing to me. But he gets, out of, he gets out of the hospital, heals from his wounds, and my staff calls me up and says, he is joining the Newark Police Department because he's not going to tolerate the violence in his community. He's going to do something about it. That's courage. Courage is the octogenarian. Who, who comes to my open office hours complaining about the trash and how dirty they are, they are, but she knows a point of wisdom, which so many folk don't know. You only have a right to complain if you have a heart to help. And so we go to look at the trashy street she was complaining about, and we see her sweeping. But where my staff says what was surprising to them is she wasn't sweeping in front of her home. They talk to the neighbors and says, this old woman who used to be a district leader and involved in this, she says, at least I'm going to sweep my entire street. People look at her, she's strange, but she's taken ownership of her street. And so to me, this is what gets me animated, what sources me, what sustains me, is because my metaphor has changed. I walked into City Hall in 2006. You heard how low I got in my very first month I would tell my staff, this is no lie, when they were telling me about a $200 million projected budget deficit, that we didn't even know how many employees we had because they didn't keep good records, where we had 4,000 employees roughly and 3,500 outstanding workman compensation claims. When the police, in the police department, I was having to pay out checks of $300,000, $400,000 because they didn't keep good records for overtime and comp time. They kept it in ledgers in pencil where I had detectives by gang task for, but in my gang task force that by union agreement were working Monday through Friday, nine to five. I don't know about Ryder College and your gang's here, Ryder University and your gang's here, but the gangs in Newark didn't work nine to five. So why did the cops do that? My police were working on typewriters that belonged in the Smithsonian. It looked like Barney Miller episodes. <laughs> Cops would make one arrest, and they would be there typing up type in triplicate. And so all of this swirling around me, by the, and uh, all punctuated by the constant beat of gunfire. I used to tell my staff, I'm a prisoner of hope. That was my metaphor. I'm a prisoner of hope. Because you can't shake hope out of me. You can't beat hope out of me. You can't crush hope out of me. I'm a prisoner of hope. But I'm telling you right now, that was 2006. Go now to 2013. My metaphor has changed. Why? Because look what we've done. Not me, but we. Look what we've done. Newark, New Jersey, 60 years of losing population. Now we're gaining population. Newark, New Jersey, decade after decade of losing tax base. Businesses and companies going the other way. Now companies are coming here. We've got companies not just coming here, bringing their headquarters, their North American and global headquarters. Heck, everybody from Panasonic bringing their North American headquarters here to write this down for you Jersey lovers. It's trivia, you gotta know. Newark, New Jersey is now the wine capital of America. Show me your pride, unfurl it, because Manischewitz has moved their headquarters to Newark. <laughs> and so, we're seeing things that haven't happened in decades. The first new hotels in our downtown in 40 years. The first new office towers in 20 years. Get this. The state population is what? 8 million, 9 million? 
We're just a city of 275,000, but 30% at the end of last quarter of last year, 30% of all the development for commercial and multifamily was going on in Newark, New Jersey. We are now the engine of economic development in the state. But it's more than that. Look what we've done together. We were one of the most underparked cities in America. Now we've had the largest parks expansion in a century, bringing together nonprofits, philanthropists, neighborhood groups, reclaiming green space. And we didn't just stop with 50, 60 acres of new parks, including one along the waterfront, 17 acres, reconnecting our city to that vital artery that was responsible for our beginning and our settlement in 1666. No, we're going back. I love my Jersey state, I love my farming, but we decided we were gonna be farming in Newark too. And now we're the biggest urban farming city in New Jersey. Acres and acres, we're just to do another two acres across the street from where I live. But more than this, we said we're gonna be innovating in other areas. It is crazy what we do in our court systems in New Jersey, it's the, we waste money in our court systems. We try the same people over and over and over again. We lock up, we love to lock people up in New Jersey. If you're, I don't care, Republican or Democrat, if you hate big government, we should all start talking about the prison systems. Because there's only one or two conclusions you can come to. Either that Americans have a higher proclivity for crime than the rest of the people on the planet Earth, or there's something wrong with this country that we like to lock people up. And then we release them and we just wait until they come back again. And so we said, we're gonna change this. We created the state's first youth court where kids coming in, we don't just throw them in there, we do something for them. We created the state's first veterans court, men and women who've served for us, created a special court that attends to their special needs and their issues. We created prison reentry programs. We've got one in Newark now, in fact, we've lowered the recidivism rate for everybody that passes our program 40%, but my favorite one, is I saw that the kids most likely to go to prison are children of incarcerated adults. So we created a fatherhood program for men and women coming out of prison. And this fatherhood program basically says that when you come out and you're a dad, you're gonna join a fraternity. I wasn't in one in Stanford, but I wanted to create one. So I created one called Delta Alpha Delta Sigma. Dads. <laughs> I don't qualify for membership because I can't keep a girlfriend. <laughs> So we put them to mentor dads, and then we give them parenting classes, and then we give them group activities for their kids. Then we bring the mothers together of those children and create co-parenting agreements. Long story short, that one program, small program in Newark, is taking a 60 plus recidivism rate now down to 7%. One small program in Newark has saved the state of New Jersey millions of dollars. I could go on about the changes in our city, doubling the pro production of affordable housing in a down housing market. I could go on with the changes in our city. We spend less today in Newark than we did when we came in because we've cut our budget, streamlined our operations, created more efficiencies. I could go on in what we've done, but the best thing I could say is my metaphors changed. That guy back in 2006 who was a prisoner of hope, my metaphor is different. I now tell people I am hope unhinged. Because I know, I know that there is nothing we can't do as Americans. Our history is a perpetual testimony to the achievement of the impossible. It is, that's who we are, it's in our DNA. And so I told you I'm gonna end with a Miss Jones story, so I'm gonna end with a Miss Jones story. There's a moment in my life when I was beginning my career I'm a kid from Bergen County. And I decided to follow that great poet of America named Chris Rock. <laughs> who said, why is it that the most violent street in every city is named for the man that stood for nonviolence? Now in fairness, when they changed High Street in Newark to Martin Luther King Boulevard, it is a street that, that spoke to its original name you go down High Street in Newark, you will see great institutions of higher learning. If you go to High Street in the city of Newark, you're gonna see great institutions like St. Benedict's and Arts High. Arts High Trailblazing, first performing arts center, a school. 
amazing trailblazing schools. But there's one strip further down around, around uh, an intersection, okay, that was right down the street from Brick Towers, that things got off the hook in the 80s and the 90s. And I moved there, and I'm telling you right now, as much as I was calling, following the calling of a great American, I got there, and I, I really honestly felt, and I'd worked everywhere from East Harlem to East Palo Alto. I'd seen tough streets, but I saw nothing like this. And I began to think that my idealism was a few steps behind my sanity. Because in my first month there, there was a body discovered bludgeon to death. There was shootings on high and spruce. There, there, there was a, a constant stream of drug dealing. I couldn't understand how the police couldn't see it. It was so brazen, so right out in the open. And I just was sort of wondering how I was going to even begin to make a difference. And, you know, when I graduated, and graduations for the, for the folks uh, who are still graduating, you, you all should thank God that your family's not like my family, because my family, the best word to describe them is crazy. Because graduations would be these moments that they show up and they just, you know, it's an educated, it's an educational institution, higher learning, but they would just act ignorant. And that's how you spell the word, by the way, <laughs> ignorant. <laughs> Because they would go crazy. This was a seminal event in the, in the life passage of the, all my grandkids, all my grandparents' grandkids. And they would make noise and they would scream and yell. You know, this poor town, Harrington Park, the first black family that comes into the town. And I could see people were wondering, is this how black people are? <laughs> they would scream and yell like crazy and embarrass my brother and I. And everybody would show up and they would tell the same stories all over and over again. And, and I tell you, you know, my grandfather would come up and say, see, boy, the tassel is worth the hassle. Yeah, granddad. <laughs> you know, he would look at me and say, you, you graduated magna cum laude. You didn't graduate magna cum laude. I see here you're not summa cum laude. You're just, thank you, laude. I'm out of here. <laughs> and <laughs> but one of the things they would always say, they would always, after the jokes pass, it would get serious. And this is a, really a quote. One of the things they would always say is, never forget you can learn more or as much from a woman on the fifth floor of the projects than you can from one of the professors at this institution. And they would get very serious and talk to me about responsibility and obligation. And so to conclude, what I found out was Miss Jones lived on the fifth floor. And people told me I had to go see her. And I went to see Miss Jones, and I knock on her door, and she opens the door, and I'm standing there, and I'm like, I'm Cory Booker. At that point, I was a Yale Law student. I said, I'm a Yale Law student. I'm here to help you almost like I was riding on my white horse with a, a degree of arrogance. And she looks at me and, and she saw right through me. And I could tell she thought to herself, you need my help. <laughs> and we talked for a while and finally she did this experiment where she says, okay, if you really want my, my, help me, you gotta follow me. And she closes the door, we walk down five flights of stairs, we walk through the lobby, through the courtyard, into the middle of Martin Luther King Boulevard. And there are cars going back and forth both directions and she says to me, what do you see around you? And I go, what do you mean? She goes, if you're going to help me, you've got to tell me what you see around you. And I described what I saw. I said, okay, I see an abandoned house. They called it Happy House, which was used for drugs. Uh, people come in with, from Mercedes to trucks to walking in, and that's where they would go to shoot up before they went to work or wherever. I, saw, I told her I saw the high rises. I, saw every, I just described the neighborhood. And at the end, she just shakes her head and says, you can't help me. And she turns around and she starts walking away. And, and I run after her, and I stop her on the side of the street, and I go, what are you talking about? And she wheels around, and she looks at me, and she says, you need to understand something. That the world you see outside of you is a reflection of what you have inside of you. And if you're one of those people who only sees problems and darkness and despair, that's all there's ever going to be. But if you're one of those stubborn people who every time you open your eyes, you see hope, you see opportunity, you see love, you see the face of God, then you can be one of those people who helps me. And she walked away leaving me there, staring at my feet, thinking to myself, okay, grasshopper, thus endeth the lesson. <laughs> I, am, I am ending with this just one simple note. I am so damn proud to be an American. It's not, it's not a false patriotism with a flag pin. No, that's not what being American's about. It's understanding the tradition that we come from 
not about race, not about religion. I'm so, I'm so happy we have the most diverse country on the globe because it really is a testimony that it's not about that. It's about an articulation of human principles, of ideals that bond us one to another deeper than religious differences, race differences, political differences. And the beauty of this country is that it was founded in perfect ideals, but a savagely imperfect reality. And that, and that even our documents reflect some of these imperfections, like our Declaration of Independence refers to Native Americans as savages and, and, and doesn't refer to women at all. And our Constitution refers to blacks as a fraction of individuals. But it's the spirit of Americans that saw these ideals and made sacrifices small over and over again to change the course of this country and make more real on the promise. And so in honor of Ms. Jones, I just want to end with this, this question that's asked that she talked about this vision. And I listen to this song all the time. We all have heard it. It's called our national anthem, but I love how it starts. It starts with that question of vision. Oh, say can you see a nation where every one of our children have a shot to manifest their genius. Oh, say can you see a nation that is free from indiscriminate violence that captures and consumes the souls of so many. Oh, say can you see a nation where somebody who's willing to work and struggle and fight can earn a living wage. Oh, say can you see a community that comes together in love in a conspiracy of love and tells the pure, simple truth of who we are. Five words, that we are a nation with liberty and justice for all. If you can see that, despite the challenges and the negativity, if you can see that without surrendering to cynicism, if you can see that, and it could be metabolized, as my father would say, that vision and energize you that I know we as a country will achieve ourselves and make real on the promise and that truly in this country, we will be free at last. Thank you, guys. Well, I don't mind going over. I'm You're going to yeah. go over yeah, 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 a couple yeah, minutes, yeah, a couple yeah, questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, I, please, thank you very much. He actually needs to go in a little. He actually needs to go in a little bit. So we've got time for a few questions. I ask you to calmly come down. You can go from side to side, but the first two need to come from writer students. Writer students, and and surprise, surprise, a politician talked too long. Okay, <laughs> somebody who's a student. <laughs> Hold on, wait a minute. You guys are dressed in suits, and you're students. <laughs> I like wore sweats. <laughs> I don't think I put on a suit and a tie ever. So are you a student? I, I'm a student. Go ahead, real quick. Talk into the mic so everybody can hear you. OK, my name is Reginald Martin. It's a pleasure to meet you. Mr. Martin. Yes. Yes. A quick question. Why is uh, Professor Reed, he said that you're his guy at Yale. Did he really say that? He said that. Give him my love. OK. Because he's my guy. OK. All right, thank you. All right. All right. What is everybody? Nobody wants to go right. Everybody wants to go left. <laughs> All right, why don't some of you guys fill in over here so we can even, oh, that's okay. So, go ahead. I'm a, a senior. I'm studying a secondary education history and uh, special ed political science. Um, I'm a, a Bonner Community Scholar, and that um, we are part-time AmeriCorps workers in Trenton, and I've served there for three years at the Trenton Area Soup Kitchen, um, Catholic Charities, and Homefront. And um, you talk about that vision, and I've had so many of my own personal experiences within the city, and um, I'm going to ask you the same question I've asked the last five governors who we've hosted, and all of them kind of... Five governors you guys have hosted? Had the, yeah. We, we had a lot in succession yeah, at, we, at one point. They, they've, a lot of quick kind of, uh, they've tiptoed around the, the question. I asked them, um, the same thing that happened in Newark has been happening in Trenton for the last 50 years. I mean, even Ryder, we used to be in Trenton, and our own administration moved out to this lovely, this lovely town. But what can we do um, as the Lawrenceville community and as Ryder students to, to bring back that miracle that you've brought back to Newark to Trenton? Well, so a couple things. First of all, it's a phenomenal question. And I, I wanted to stop you about this, using that word miracle because Newark, we still have a lot of challenges. And I'll give you one to confess the work that's yet to be done. 
Um, I got the Kids Count Report, which is a wonderful association for the children of New Jersey, a wonderful organization. If you look at the Kids Count Report in Newark, we've created all this economic development, but child poverty in the last year went up. And so I've got 40% of my, my women who are having babies getting no prenatal care or late prenatal care. And so I can go through all these statistics that show you that the battle ain't over in Newark, that we have a lot of work to do as a community together. But this is what I, I, I feel very strongly. It's, it's not a matter of can we, as I was making the point earlier, it's not a matter of can we do it, it's a matter of do we have the collective will to do it. And, and so Trenton is it's the same thing we saw in Newark. Trenton is this amazing city with innate assets. And what we did in Newark is we sat down before I was even mayor and said, let's just roll out the map and, and talk about what our assets are. And let me just give you two examples. One we found out, we, we called in the Boston Consulting Group and said, where do people who live in Newark spend their money? And we found out they were spending between half a billion and a billion dollars outside of our city. And we're like, wow, that's untapped economic potential. Then we start analysis and start seeing lots of things. Like Newark, our, one of the advantages we have competitively is that we have the third busiest port in America. That we have the second busiest port in America in terms of values of goods. And so we started doing a deeper analysis of our port and found that people would bring their goods and services to our port and they would be like, let's get the heck out of Newark. And they would drive all their goods and services down to exit 8A and warehouse them then. Now listen to this insanity. Then when it was time to get their stuff to market, they would put them back on trucks drive them back into Newark to use our air freight, our rail lines, and an intersection of highways. So they were basically adding expense to their, to their logistics chain. They were hurting our environment by burning fuel, all these things. And so when we saw those, those were just two of the things that gave us clear strategies of what to do. So two things we did, very practically. One is I went out and started talking to warehousing distribution companies, telling them about the silliness of doing it where, the way they were doing it. Now Newark has one of the biggest booms in, in warehouse and logistics on our port, creating, no exaggeration, thousands of jobs, construction jobs and permanent jobs. And we have companies like Wakefern, the biggest refrigerated distribution uh, uh, mode for them, serving from Boston to Baltimore. We have companies like Bartlett's Dairy. If you walk to a, any Starbucks in New York City, please do what I do, which is I walk in there and I pick up anything, milk, cookies, anything, and I hold it up high, do this when you do, and I scream, Newark, New Jersey, because <laughs> That's where we supply all the Starbucks in this region. So please do that for me. Remind folks. Uh, um, Bloomberg has had me cited a few times, but if we all do it, he can't get us all. Um, Bloomberg. <laughs> um, and, so, and so that's a strategy that we aligned all of our energy behind, not just the city government, but everybody. The strategy on the spending money out of our town, we said, okay, there's a problem here, that our people should be spending money in town. But yet we started talking, digging deeper in that, and there were a lot of entrepreneurs who wanted to start businesses, restaurants, clothing stores, but they didn't have access to capital. So one of the ways we did with this is we started, the first fund we started was $14 million. We leveraged city money. With, now, some people say this is not the role of government, Corey. Well, look, if the banks aren't loaning, if the banks aren't loaning, we need to disrupt the banks. Now, I'm all for creative disruption. It's happening, your generation, unless you are really 60 and you just look remarkably young, <laughs> your generation is all about disruption. This is why I love your generation. You're disrupting the big banks. You know how you're doing it? Kiva and Kickstarter, which are showing ways to get access to capital without going through the banks. It's the democratization of capital. You're, you're disrupting economic potential. I just sat, I was at the South by Southwest Conference. I sat with people from Airbnb, Uber, and Lyft something called collaborative consumption, where you can now use the extra space in your car. You can use the, your apartment. When you leave, away for two weeks to go home to your parents, you can rent that out through Airbnb. And so we wanted to disrupt. We're not going to wait. We have a mission. We created a loan fund. We created businesses in our city, over 50 businesses grown or expanded, that are catering to capture that latent economic potential. We have crazy anomalies now. One of the busiest subways in the entire region is in Newark, New Jersey. It goes 24 hours a day and delivers because that's how much the demand was. So Trenton, I love this city of Trenton. What history. Trenton is why America exists. When Washington was writing... When, when Washington was writing literally the most cynical, like, desperate letters that, that the war was over, it was Trenton that sparked the first light of America that we would be a country where impossible dreams happen. So what I'm just saying to you right now is it's a matter of will, and you be a poet. America needs more poets. 
wake up the moral imagination of your community, your student body, others, to do things they wouldn't do. It's ridiculous in New Jersey that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of kids on waiting lists for mentors. You want to stop juvenile crime in Newark and, and Trenton? Make sure every kid in the fourth grade has a mentor. Every kid. Or just go to teachers. So you have that power. I'm moving over here to this young lady. But thank you. You're incredible. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. Put you. the other governors to shame with the way they answer. Thank you very much. Don't, you're going to get me in trouble. It's Chris Christie here. OK. All right. Okay. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm actually, I was born in Newark, New Jersey. You, where were you born? Um, High Street. UMD, UMD and J. You were born in UMD and J, but your family lived on High Street. Yes. Oh my gosh. But now I live in Montclair, but I was okay, born Okay, but where there. on High Street did they live? Um, I was young. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I stay, only stayed there. I was an infant. But okay. That, that's where I was Okay. Born. I'm holding um, it against you. Don't remember your first year. <laughs> I mean, it's messed up. But go ahead. <laughs> However, um, what is your position on fracking? On fracking? Yes. What is my position on fracking? That is the first person ever to ask me that question. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, so I have to say, I have never had to deal with this question as a mayor of Newark. So the questions I have to deal with as mayor, I can go deep and I know them left and right. But I have looked as an observer from, the, from afar and I look at fracking, I have some thoughts on fracking, but I do not have a formed position yet on fracking. Okay. Can I say it that way, as sounding like a politician? So these are my thoughts about fracking. So we have a chance in America that excites me a lot, which is the idea that we could one day be energy independent uh, in America. And we should strive for that and that we should have a, as Obama says, an all of the above policy, have a blend of energy producing. But at the same time, we should have the same kind of obsession with keeping our country's environment uh, clean and, and, and strong. This is why I have some problems with New Jersey state policy, when we pulled out of the regional environmental greenhouse gas agreements. And, and like, so we have coal plants now and across the, the, the state line, polluting our atmosphere, giving people in Trenton and Newark and other places epidemic levels of asthma, uh, um, um, that's problematic to me. And so the little bit that I've looked into fracking, and then I'll switch, is that, that, that if it's not tightly regulated, that a lot of these wildcatters that are going out there are, are prone to do some very, very damaging things. So the water that they inject down there, and then when it comes up, there's cases where people just dump that water irresponsibly and ki will kill, kill life for long periods of time. And so what I'm starting to see is that is there a middle way to go, and again, people are afraid of the word regulation. I am not. I'm very happy um, that there are things that are regulated, like when you build a home. And I've seen people who don't abide by local regulations on building standards, and that home crumbles, or people die as a result. I'm very happy that our food is regulated, and we've lowered the cases of botulism and things like that. And so I think under the right conditions um, that we can do, we can start accessing that natural gas, but it's got to be really tight, and we should be overly cautious in the way that we deal with the people, the corporations are involved in that. Okay. All right? Thank you. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pull my rank, uh, and, and, and that I control the, okay, I'm going to pull my rank. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go if it's okay with four more questions. One, two, one, two. All right. Sorry, Mark, Matson. I'm still the mayor. <laughs> All right. So uh, let, let's start on our right and we'll go to the left and we'll go to the we'll go to the right and then we'll go to the left. And you are the last question. It's gotta be meaningful, it's gotta make people cry. It's the end of the night, okay? So yes, sir. And I am I wanna just say right away, you are probably a good man with a good heart, and I am a person of love but you are rising this feeling of jealousy in me because of the hair that you have. <laughs> and I almost feel like you came up here just to mock me. I did, I did not do that okay, in any okay, sort of way. So. Okay, just so we're clear. But thank you for the compliment, I'll take it. You didn't just spend like the last six months, Corey's gonna come here, I'm gonna grow out my hair and stick it to him. I've been like this since like eighth grade, so. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for being such an advocate on poverty and people who are in like the working poor in this country because I feel like that's an issue that's not really highlighted at all by the media. They don't really pay attention to it that much at all. And I'd like to thank you so much for doing that. I'm actually conducting an independent study as one of my course classes here at Ryder on poverty. And I call it uh, the poverty industrial complex, which is basically these fundamental variables that come together that influence upward mobility within our society 
and I was wondering if you could give me some insight on what those are to Newark and then and outward and why this isn't an issue because when you look at the research poverty is one of the most fundamental you know creation origins so for, let me first of all why first of all poverty please come here for a second I gotta, I gotta hug you that's an awesome question <laughs> I, I was I was hating on you, and now you ask a question like that, and that makes me so happy. Right. Um, so this guy is so spot on, and and I want to just really emphasize uh, how spot on you are. But Thank can you. I start just one little way of saying this? Is one of my my life ambitions? You know, you think about what do you want them to say about you when you're dead, um, and and some people wish that on me a lot quicker than I want it for myself. <laughs> Um, but the one thing I would love to have one of the themes of my life be, which I've already mentioned tonight, is how much we, we really need each other in society. And how much, you know, there's an old African saying, if you want to go fast, uh, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And what, what politics, what I don't like about, what I want to cure, and what I want to be a part of the cure about politics is it loves to drive us apart. It loves to give us this illusion that we don't have a common destiny. As, as King said uh, so eloquently in the letters from the Birmingham jail, we're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a common garment of destiny. That's the great part here. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so what I'd love to, like one of the themes of my life I want to do is to let people know that whether you are a uh, Hasidic Jew in Bergen County or a Imam in Trenton, whether you are wealthy in the hills of Summit or poor in, in a school in Camden, we all are so elegantly connected to each other. And now politics, the problem with our politics is that it's a, we aren't like life. Politics is that we, we tend to perceive of it as a zero-sum game endeavor, where if you win, I lose. If your side gets an advantage, my side gets a disadvantage. When we know from every analytical and ana every analysis possible that society works in the exact opposite. In fact, if more kids get a better education, it has a return on our GDP and our whole economy expands. In fact, there's a wonderful study I talked about, I talk about all the time, uh, McKinsey's disparity report that they did in 2009 about the racial disparity in education, and they pinned that as a, as a drain on our economy to the point of $2.3 trillion, and that they, they project it out if, if demographics continue, that it could be a weight on our economy, they call it the imposition of a permanent recession. And so we don't understand that the lack of education in Patterson or Newark is undermining all of us. In the same way that poverty is, is, is hurts us all, not just the family that's inflicted. And, and that we should know, as Langston Hughes said so eloquently, that there's a dream in this land with its back against the wall. To save the dream for one, we must save the dream for all. So now let me get very practical to you. So we should have a goal in this society that every one of our young people, this is it, because I believe there are some lazy people and there are some people really switched on that want to apply their gifts and so on. So I don't believe we should all end equal. I believe that we should all have an equal shot. The problem with poverty, though, is it undermines the ability for you to even get a fair shot at manifesting your genius. And the, the fact that we believe in, as politicians that we can't even mention that word, that we can go through elections and tell the lie of saying everybody's middle class. It's just about the middle class. No, we, this is something that we have to focus on and deal with. So let me talk, go to, to right to your point of the, of the incredible uh, trap that people get born. I have tons of these examples, but for the sake of time, I'm going to give one trap. So I, I'm, in, I'm in Newark, and I am a young woman, and I want to play by the rules, work hard in my high school. This is a true story, and it came from my, the head of my county college. And I graduate with A's and B's, which is impressive to me, because I got into Stanford because of a 4.0 in 1600. 4.0 yards per carry and 1,600 receiving yards. <laughs> um, so I'm impressed with AB students. And then she goes to our county college, okay? She can barely afford it, but she gets a Pell Grant, okay? And now she goes to county college and they give her an entrance test and they say, you don't qualify for taking, uh, uh, you don't qualify for taking uh, college level courses. And she's like, wait a minute, I was an AB student. But this happens across the board. We, we've seen honor, we've seen um, uh, uh, students that were on the honor roll, 
they could not take college level courses. So now she has to take remedial classes at the county college and she has to pay for them. Taxpayers paid for this education, but she didn't receive it. And so she eats through her Pell Grant. And so the head of our county college tells me these stories, which they finished taking all those classes, but now they don't have any money left. Their Pell Grant is gone. And so they've been working at night or during the day to try to keep food on the table if they have a child, and they get hit the wall where there's no way to get beyond that wall because they've got to work. They've got to provide for a child. And so they, she sees so many of these people dropping out and get stuck in this terrible world we're in right now, which is that this is a terrible trend in America where there's a decoupling between wage growth, okay, which is declining, and economic growth, which in America is still increasing. And so we're now stuck in this trap that's getting worse in America because the more education you receive, the more you're going to learn. But we have a lot of people that are trapped and not getting the kind of education they want. And so this is just one of many traps, many traps that people don't talk about. And by not talking about it or focusing about them, we're not gearing our, our, our policy, our energy to, to stop them. Poverty, we, I, my, my father used to say this to me wrongly. He said, oh, you know, there'll always be poor people. I'm like, no, we live in a society of abundance. And I, and I believe in the free market. I, I've gotten in trouble for trying to defend the free market before. But I think that we have to be activists in engaging uh, in making the rules work for everybody. And whether that's horrible, and, and this is the last thing I'll say because I shouldn't leave, whether, what's allowing bad things to happen is that, um, is that we, don't, we, don't, we don't have activists like you that are watching these traps. And, and when you are not, when, you're, when democracy is a spectator sport and individual interests and human interests decline, special interests get a lot more power. And so you see credit card companies who, get, who run ripshot over, over Congress and get laws that create more traps. You see bankruptcy laws like they have in the last 10 years get changed uh, down in Congress because people like you uh, and others have not leaned in as much as we should to stop this. And there's more traps that are created. And so I feel very passionately about this issue. And I hope in my career, not only can I be a voice for the first part to people understand that we, we, we can't lose more people to poverty, we can't lose more people, but that we have to, and, and we, need, we, we, we have to actively engage in that, but creating a society where every single person can, can get a fair shot to, to live a life where their wisdom and their genius gets made manifest, that that is going to be the de de deciding factor whether America becomes America or not. All right, thank you for that great question. All right, real quick. I can feel it. I'm not even going to look over them, but Mark Matson is burning hole in the side of my head right now. So go ahead, real quick. Uh, my name is Patrick Hall, and um, I'm the only declared uh, candidate at this point for mayor for the city of Trenton. Okay. And um, just wanted to say I'd written a letter, and uh, your office got back to me very quickly, so I appreciate that. We love mayors and mayors to be, or <laughs> okay. aspirational mayors. Uh, the question I have for you, I Shave have your head closer. And, and it'll, it'll be do better. <laughs> I, try okay. to keep it. I tell that to Obama all the time. <laughs> and I don't know why suddenly he just goes to Secret Service. <laughs> I tell you always, <laughs> go ahead. But um, I believe in reinvesting uh, in our citizens uh, that makes the actual change. And the change in the environment changes the mindset that actually causes real change that happens. Uh, my question to you is, when you started to make some moves and sort of you know, think outside of the box in the city of Newark, did you get any opposition from your council, and how did you handle that, if you did? <laughs> okay, so we're, let's talk about laws of physics here. <laughs> because I try to take refuge, as, refuge, re, refuge in, in physics a lot, because you know, I like the, the first law of thermal dynamics, which you can't destroy energy. So the more love that you put out in the world, the more it's going to ripple throughout society. The other thing is, any time you try to move forward, there is naturally resistance to that, to, to when you're trying to, so anything that you try to do for good, um, people are gonna people are gonna try to stop you, and and that's just the nature of the game that you're you're in and that I'm in, especially in a political world, and and they just recently I saw this, I think I saw it in the USA Today, where they had the same educational policy thing, and they said um, they they polled people, Republicans and Democrats, uh, and they sort of used four categories. 
They polled Republicans and said, this is a Republican idea, what do you think? They called Republicans and said, this is a Democratic idea, what do you think? They did the same thing. And it's amazing. As soon as you say that an idea is a Republican to a Republican, they love the idea. As soon as you say it's a Democratic idea to a Democrat, they love the idea. But if you say it's a Republican idea to a Democrat, they hate the idea and vice versa. And that just goes to show you that people just want to be opposition just for the sake of being opposition. And, and so for me, um, you know, I, there's a lot of celebration about my so-called fights with my city council, but, but I've only had one policy defeat in the entire time that I've been as mayor. In fact, we've worked in incredible unity um, in the things that we're trying to do because to the credit of my council, uh, the majority of them look at the idea at the end of the day and what's going to benefit a city. And, and when you have the crises and urgencies in Trenton and Newark, which are not in Trenton and Newark's crises and urgencies, they're New Jersey's urgencies, we really don't have the time or the luxury to fight each other all the time and stop what's going on. All right? Good luck to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Hi. The penultimate question. Not as much pressure as the ultimate question. Um, and, and what is your name? My name is Alicia DeGraw, and I'm, I'm a sophomore educator elementary education major. And where are you from? I'm from Hackettstown, New Jersey. I know where? Hackettstown. I love Hackettstown. Really? Yes. M&M's. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. Stop. <laughs> what, what, what did you say? M&M's. M&M's? Yeah, we're the, um, like. Your, your, your school mascot is a candy? No. We Not, are the. Because um, M&M's, by the way, does anybody know that? We got to start with our Jersey trivia, folks. <laughs> M&M's were created in New Jersey. And until Kentucky came along and knocked us out recently, we were the, the world's number one producers of M&Ms. Yeah, because my town actually is the Mars headquarters. And I Fort went North. there. Really? And I, I probably broke a lot of ethics laws <laughs> because I went on the official tour, and every time they weren't looking at me, I put my hand <laughs> in the machine and threw as much. I was I love Lucy. I was putting the chocolate in my mouth. Um, if you laughed at that joke, you were dating yourself. <laughs> um, Anyway, yes, I love, this is the, can we just talk for a second? Sure. <laughs> we, New Jersey's got to get its pride back. Yeah. People don't understand how great this state is. Yeah. I mean, I go around to other states and I get in the face of my peers because every state that I've been able to find that has a state logo, motto, New Jersey should own that motto. Yeah. Let me give you an example. The Empire State, right? Right across the river. I don't mean to insult New Yorkers. If you get upset at me, remember I have security. Um, the, did you know that if it wasn't for the I-beam that was invented in New Jersey, you would not have been able to build those steel buildings as high as they were? So I go to New Yorkers all the time. I get in Bloomberg's face, which is not a, I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, um, his security is bigger than mine. Uh, um, Let's go to another state. <laughs> Dude, I'm, the worst thing you should do, the people that are charged with protecting you, don't insult them. <laughs> okay, so then like, let's go to like North Carolina. What's their, what's, what are they? First in flight, okay. Did you guys know the first recorded flight in America was not in North Carolina? It was in New Jersey. It was a balloon flight. We were the first in flight. Let me give you another one. Let's like try Virginia. What's theirs? Okay, I got this one. Hold on. Some people don't think I could get this one. I will get this one. Did you all know that the drive-in movie theater was invented in New Jersey? <laughs> and there was a whole lot of loving going on there in the drive. I was conceived in a double feature. <laughs> Now, if you laugh at this part, you know your age. It was a Sydney Portier double feature. <laughs> in the heat of the night, <laughs> followed by guess who's coming to dinner. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. That's a, little, that's a little over 45 joke. All right, somebody got that? Hey, thank you very much. All right, anyway, we got to get our pride back. New Jersey, we got to get our pride back again. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. You would love my roommate then. She's just New Jersey everywhere. I lose New Jersey. Okay, go ahead. Um, so first, I just want to thank you so much for, you, you have to go. And I think it's really cool as a politician, you're, you're just giving so much time to college students. So first, I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm just shilling for volunteers on my next campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I will help you. <laughs> this is just a transparent attempt for me <laughs> to get people to come volunteer. You could be a motivational speaker or a comedian. Okay. <laughs> um, but I just, with your education, um, I know Mark Zuckerberg gave so much money to New York. Yes. New York, and um, is that... 
is that money really going to good use? That's a great question. Um, so let me, let me just, well, first of all, you can go to the website for the Foundation for Newark's Future and figure out what we're doing. So you get $100 million, and it's a matching grant. So we've had to raise about two, another $100 million. Um, and the question is, is, well, what would you do with it? Because remember, the budget for our school system is a billion dollars annually. So in terms of percentage, it's actually not that much money. Right. But So we wanted to make sure we were using the money for things that could leverage long-term change and that we wouldn't need every single year. And so we started looking at best practices around the country to figure out where things were working and where things were not, and could we do things here? So one is we found that there were a lot of great school models around the country um, that ranged from public school models, d district school models, to charter school models that we saw that had startup co costs, costs of entry, um, but that long term they could sustain themselves. So one thing is we spent for new school models, and we've partnered with universities uh, um, uh, that have come in and done great schools where kids now, we have one school where kids can graduate with college credits. Uh, I think up to their sophomore year, uh, which saves them money. So we've done that. We've created a teacher's innovation fund because innovation, I just coming back from South by Southwest, is incredible, but innovations are not just the Mark Zuckerbergs or the, or the Steve Jobs. Teachers are some of the greatest innovators because often with little resources, they find ways to push the needle under very difficult circumstances. And so this teacher innovation fund was really incentivizing teachers to give us your best ideas. We'll give you resources to develop them so we can grow them to scale. But the, probably the biggest um, innovation and the biggest cost was to work with the teachers union, AFT, to get a new teacher's contract. And I'm very excited about that new teacher's contract um, that we did in partnership with the unions um, that's created a, a model contract, in my opinion, that's far ahead of any place else in America. And what they've done is really created a collaborative atmosphere where ultimately, and I think this is wrong, where we've been able to change some of the things I think are wrong. Like, for example, if you poll college juniors, I think this is like a 2006 study, so it's a little dated, but, and, and ask them how many want to be teachers, like you, it's something like a little over, less than 5% want to be teachers. Now, if, however, you increase the salary significantly, 50% or more, that number goes up to over 40% of kids want to be teachers. And so one of my beliefs is, is, is we, would, we would increase the strength of the profession by creating a bigger pipeline of people interested in the job. And so we see these teachers in Newark who are unbelievably dedicated, who are doing incredibly difficult work. You know, I've gone to classrooms for entire days, and by the time I finish, I don't know what it is. It's like I play football, and, and it's painful. But something about teaching for a day for me, I would go home and my body ached. Uh, it was hard, <laughs> right? But, but we don't pay, in my opinion, we do not pay teachers enough in America. And then number two. Thank you. <laughs> we give them no incentives to do, the, to do, to do more. Yeah. So I've seen teachers in schools, one comes in early in the morning, meets with students before class, stays late with students after class, uh, goes home and does home visits, is accessible on their cell phone, gets incredible results. Some teachers who don't do a lot less than that, and yet there's no pay differential whatsoever. So we created a system in Newark where using teachers evaluating other teachers, where we said we're going to start paying based upon performance. And performance is not high-stake testing, which I'm, I'm against high-stake testing. Thank you. Okay, but, but there's got to be some fair that has some quantitative and some qualitative analysis done by peers where we can evaluate which teachers are making a difference. And so we've created incentives not just for performance, but also incentives for taking on the more difficult jobs. And the last thing I'll say is one thing, and this is where we may disagree, and that's okay because it makes for a healthy uh, conversation, but I also think there's some things that teachers get their salary based on that make no, diff make no sense to me. Like, for example, my father used to say to me, son, you got more, more degrees in the month of July, but you're not hot, um, <laughs> which was very, very true because um, I've got lots of letters. Uh, I've, I stayed, in, un unlike most of you all, I s said, the real world can wait. I'm going to stay in the comfortable shelter of academia for as long as people will pay me to do so. And so I stayed and did a graduate degree at Stanford, paid for by football, applied for a Rhodes Scholarship, got that paid for. As soon as I started paying my own, I'm like, let me get out of here, which is my <laughs> last degree, and make some money. So, so, so the, the, the idea that you who are training as an undergraduate right now to be a teacher, and me with multiple degrees, that I would be on a different pay scale than you, you're probably a much more competent teacher than me, but I would get paid more because I have lots of degrees. And that makes no sense. There's no correlation. And if you create a system that's fair, 
and my degree is making me a better teacher, then I'm going to get paid that more money for those results, but not just because I walk in with fancy degrees. And so we try to create what we think is the fairest teacher contract, an advanced teacher contract that makes a big difference. And, and we've also done things to support teachers, like ending uh, forced placement. And, and other things that, that were good. So check it out. I'm really proud of the progress we're making. And the number of our kids in high-performing schools in Newark is increasing every single year. Okay? Thank you so much. Last question. Thank you. <laughs> this is pressure. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I got to get this ready. Got to get this ready. Got to get this. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm ready to cry. Okay. Hi, Mayor Booker. Um, I'm currently a graduate student at the College of New Jersey. I'm studying urban education there and I'm student teaching right in Trenton now. Oh my gosh. And I would just like to ask you, um, what advice do you have for teachers who are working really hard to inspire their students to become these agents of change, to equip students to make a difference in their communities, and moreover, just to instill in their students a mindset that they can do whatever they set their minds to? Okay, um, that's, so first of all, thank you um, <laughs> for what you're doing. And it, 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 the, the quality of the teacher in a classroom um, is the most determinative thing about the outcome of that, that, that kid's, uh, in, in the classroom, the quality of the teacher in the school is the most determinative thing in the, in the outcome of that kid in their learning. I always say that, but I want to stop because the forces of that kid's success that are most affected have nothing to do with what's going on in that school, mm -hmm. and they have to do with the community and the neighborhood around there. Mm -hmm. And so some of the innovations we're doing in Newark um, as some people in this might know, there's this amazing, I should memorize this data point because it's so dramatic, about the number of books per child in certain areas. So in areas like where I grew up, there's like you know five, six, seven books per child in their house that are accessible and age appropriate. In areas uh, like I work at in Newark, you sometimes have one book for five kids. You don't, you don't have kids that even have access to tools. So we've done a big program with a philanthropist where we're gonna get half of our kids, half of our grade school kids, are going to have their own home libraries where they will own up to 10 books. And so we're, we're, we have a philanthropist that's making this all available, hundreds of thousands of books for people's homes. And that's very important because 15 minutes, as you know, of reading to a kid at night would have them coming to school equipped to learn, not behind in vocabulary words. But I think you're asking a more, to me, what I interpret as a more of a spiritual question, which is yeah. often yeah. the best things we learn in school are not just reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's actually the value system of believing in yourself, uh, mm -hmm. of aspiring to make a difference in the world, of many of the things that, um, that uh, I, I learned and I, I, I learned from my parents as well as from some extraordinary teachers whose names I still know, who I still have some relationships with, who are just incredible and I imagine that you're, you're one of those teachers. And so the, the only thing I can say to you, um, um, and, and, I, and I say this with ending with a story because I, I love to tell uh, the crazy stories from my life, um, is just a, a, a wonderful quote by James Baldwin, and then I'll end with a story, and then I'll, and, I'll, and I'll shut up, because people here all have to get home. Um, uh, so the James Baldwin quote in the book called, and uh, it's a quote that says basically, children are never good at learning from their elders, but they never fail to imitate them. And, and I've come to learn that, that you manifesting the values that you embody is going gonna, is gonna to have an impact on the kids around you more than you can ever imagine. And I know that there's exercises, value clarification exercises and the like, that really do make a big difference. And, I, and I'm not the person that could, could talk to you about that pedagogy. Um, I think that you can find peers that can do it. I could probably learn from you uh, more than you can learn from me when it, when it, when it comes to imparting uh, those values on kids. But I really want to just get you, and this is the story, the last corny story that I'll tell, um, about this idea that just by being you every moment of every day, um, and not shrinking, just by being you, you will make an impact far beyond that you know. And, and so if you allow me, the, the last convoluted story that I'll tell tonight um, is, um, is about my first uh, 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 plane flights I was started taking regularly back and forth from, uh, from Newark Airport to San Francisco Airport where I was, when I was going to Stanford. And what year did you say you were? I'm a graduate student. You're a graduate student. Yeah. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're a graduate student. Uh, so I was a sophomore. I was 19 years old. And traveling for me, I imagine, is a little different than traveling for you um, because I am large and, and you, are av you are like a normal sized human being. <laughs> and, and, and so traveling in coach um, then, and by the way, then I was playing football and so I was chiseled. Uh, <laughs> would you imagine that for me, please? <laughs> um, um, now I just jiggle. But back then, Chisel. Um, and, and so I would sit in these seats 
And it would be torture because people would put the seat back and it's like a slam. I did that today. I flew uh, in and it's just, it's a hard thing to do, but, but it's a wonderful thing when you have nobody sitting next to you. So I flew on this flight and I knew it was going to be miserable because the, the airport, New York airport was packed. Everybody was flying. It was like the end of Thanksgiving and everybody goes on this flight and they're just like pushing and shoving and overhead baggage. And you can really see this state of evolution of human beings by how they act in airports. Um, um, <laughs> And so I had not evolved, so I'm like, oh, this is and I sit down, and the door of the plane closes, and I suddenly look around at all these miserable human beings packed in these seats, but next to me, there were two open seats. I had hectares of space suddenly, mm -hmm. and I came to the only conclusion possible, um, and you understand this, but the only conclusion I really could come to was the obvious one, that God loved me more than all those other people. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> and so I start stretching out, and like I'm, I'm like, I'm like enjoying my space. I'm like luxuriating in the space, and I'm looking with pity at all those people who do not have God's favor. And and I was singing the songs, "Yes, Jesus loves me," <laughs> and 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 so suddenly, just as I'm like stretching myself out, the door to the plane opens, and the cabin to the plane fills with this cacophonous screams, and everybody just shut up and leans forward. We all couldn't imagine either there was some crime being committed outside of that door, or some beast was about to walk in. And unfortunately, it was the latter, because this beast that came in with three heads, a three-headed beast, it was a woman with a little boy and a baby. <laughs> but it wasn't a normal baby. This baby had, was a, was, had a birth defect where its lungs took up its entire body because no human being has ever made such a blood-curdling sound. It was like somebody took a speaker and hooked it up to a nuclear-powered generator. And at the moment that this, 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 this beast walks in, everybody on that plane, you have these moments in life, everybody can appreciate when I say this, where you suddenly have advanced extrasensory perception where you could read everybody's mind because everybody was looking at the beast and then slowly, as if in unison, synchronized head turning, they all looked at me. And, it was, and I knew what they were all thinking. They were thinking, you smug little man. It, it serves you right. And so here comes this woman. It was like the green mile of sorts that she was walking, but it wasn't her death, it was mine. <laughs> and she's coming towards me and she stops there with the little boy and the woofer and tweeter and, and she asks me a question. Now I have a list in my office of the stupidest questions I've ever asked in my life. And this, has made the, this stupid question makes that list because she's sitting there, sir, I'm sitting there, and I look up at her and I said, are you sure? <laughs> and she, out of some kind of mercy, she just gives me the feigned look, yes sir, I'm, I'm sitting there. And so now she climbs over me, three bodies, two seats, and I sit there thinking, this is gonna be the longest flight of my life. But this is what I was talking about before, about hiding, shrinking from who you truly are, that every moment is, a, is an opportunity. To, to manifest your truth. It's an opportunity to either accept conditions where they are, surrender to cynicism, surrender to negativity, or to understand, and I really believe this, that the biggest thing we can do in any day is a small act of kindness, of decency, of love. And you live in a world as a teacher where it, the small moment, the things I remember about my teachers, never any grand gestures, it was always that small things that they did that showed me their humanity, that showed me their love, that made me feel special. And so with this woman, I took a deep breath and I said, I'm not gonna let this be the worst part of my life. In fact, I'm determined to make it the best. And I turned around and I started talking to her. And as soon as I got out of my own drama, which we all get sucked into, and I suddenly realized that this woman was, everybody on that plane was just cutting her with their eyes as if she stood outside of the plane before she walked in and stopped and looked at her baby and said, okay, now cry as loud as you can. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and so I started seeing her being exasperated and we started talking and I started trying to tell her just, corny little jokes and seeing if I could make her laugh and the and 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 and, and she looked more annoyed but um and and 
making faces at the baby, but finally she relaxed, I relaxed, finally the baby started crying after me contorting my face, and we were taking off, and now she and I are just into a great conversation. And I'll never forget the movie Glory came on. Some of you all remember that movie with Denzel Washington, and I still remember that scene where he's like this, and, and it's just a powerful movie, and she, and she, like, I, she says what I guess a, a lot of my friends now who are, who are new, families, new families, she's like, I haven't been to the movies in the longest time. And I'm like, look, watch that movie. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll sit and, and, and play games with your son. Watch that movie. And so she holds her baby, she watches this great movie. Me and him play tic-tac-toe and hangman. And then I unleash upon him when I knew his mother was distracted all the corniest jokes I had appropriate for a little boy. Like, why, does, why did Tigger and Eeyore have their heads in the toilet? Because they were looking for poo. <laughs> anyway, so I'm sorry guys, it's late. This is the end of the story. We land and it was like the quickest flight I ever taken cross country. I was lifted, we were lifted, we were laughing. Everybody else looked still like, ugh. We were lifted, we walked, we exchanged information, we said that we would keep in touch. We never kept in touch. <laughs> Five years passed, 10 years passed, 15 years passed. And I was in my first run for mayor in 2002. Uh, uh, I lost that election. And my advice to everybody here is if you're going to have a spectacular failure, have a documentary team there to capture it. Um, <laughs> because it became a movie called Street Fight that, was that won the Tribeca Film Festival, was nominated for an Academy Award, and then lost to a movie originally titled March of the Damn Penguins. Um, <laughs> and, and, and if you remember that movie, for those of you who saw the film, it was a brutal election, and on my, one of my most discouraged days, I was sitting in my city council office just feeling so discouraged, and I get this letter in the mail, almost as if God had pulled it out and put it in my hand, and I opened it up, and it was from a woman who said, you may not remember me, but 15 years ago, I met you on a flight, and your kindness, I will never forget. It was the first time I flew with my kids, and, and then she goes on and on and, 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 and tells what meaningful, it was meaningful to have that, a person sitting next to her who was willing to show her generosity and compassion. Long story short, she ends the letter by saying that her family's in Newark. They owned a factory in my city. And she said that she told the people who worked at the factory, the Newark residents, they couldn't tell them what my platform was or what I believed on fracking, um, <laughs> but they could tell them what kind of character that I had. And, and so I came to the factory and I met the workers and the young boy was now a young man, became one of my best campaign volunteers. And I think he actually is a graduate from this institution, no less. And amazingly, um, amazingly, she asked me a question that every politician in America really likes except for Bloomberg, which is, can we also give you a campaign contribution? So, so I tell you that story just to really drive home the point and I end with this is that be you. You are a beautiful human being. I could see it from here. Be you, I'm serious. Your kids are gonna thrive off of your energy by you showing up every day, sharing your kindness, sharing your heart. That's what we ask for this world, not for us to be presidents or senators or entrepreneurs. What we, what we really are called to do is to be who we were created to be, be people of love, of goodness, of kindness, of sharing. And, and then all of our kids, if they experience that light, they will thrive in it. And you may leave this earth. You may one day leave this earth but the love that you imparted to that next generation will go on to eternity. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank Just you. wonderful. Oh, thank you so much for thank doing you. it. Really appreciate thank you very it. much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Cory Booker. <laughs> Everyone, have a safe trip home. Please be careful out there. Thank you for coming. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you.